Welcome to Get Rich Education. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. With more than 250 weekly real estate investing episodes produced, we've never talked about real estate developed on the oceans, yet 70% of the Earth's surface is covered in water. Rather than homesteading, we discuss the future of seasteading with a great guest today on Get Rich Education. Countless property investors get killed with maintenance costs, but that's far less likely when you buy brand new construction. Let me tell you about JWB Real Estate Capital in Jacksonville, Florida. They pioneered the build to rent model where you can invest in new construction turnkey rental properties. That's why JWB was featured on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. To learn more and see inventory, go to newconstructionturnkey.com. Finally, Total Control Financial gives you checkbook control of your 401k and IRA money to invest in real estate. It's time to get your retirement money into your own checking account, but you've got to avoid the little known tax that you'll pay with any self-directed IRA. Instead, it's time for the QRP. Learn more and get your free copy of the QRP book by text messaging QRP in all capital letters to 72000. You're listening to the show that has created more financial freedom than nearly any show in the world. This is Get Rich Education. Welcome to GRE from St. Petersburg, Russia to St. Petersburg, Florida and across 188 nations worldwide. I'm Keith Weinhold. This is Get Rich Education. And sometimes in investing and in real estate, you've got to pull back, think bigger picture, think longer term, and even contemplate some new paradigms that really challenge your thinking. Well, that's squarely what we're doing today. And we're pushing the limits of real estate and even a potential future frontier for real estate as we discuss seasteading, building floating cities on the ocean. Now, you might remember when author and futurist Stephen Kotler was here a few years ago, we discussed the future of real estate, even so far as the prospects for mining asteroids. Way back in episode 13, I discussed how autonomous cars, driverless cars, will change the future of real estate. As you're going to see today, whether it's autonomous cars or seasteading, a fundamental change to the very chessboard that real estate sits on top of can disrupt how humans interact with each other. Seasteads make you more mobile. Your taxes go down when you have choice. And this mobility where you can just float your home or community over to an adjacent seastead. So it's really then often about a human desire for values like freedom and choice and liberty. Now, agriculture or aquaculture, as it may be in this case, can thrive on seasteads. The Seasteading Institute was founded by Peter Thiel, the well-known entrepreneur and venture capitalist. We'll talk with the Seasteading Institute's president in just a few minutes here. You'll see that it isn't just Peter Thiel, but there's an intersection with the famous Nobel Prize winning economist Milton Friedman here as well. I want to remind you that you're invited to join me October 10th to 12th, 2019 in Tampa, St. Petersburg, Florida for Get Rich Education's Tampa Bay Real Estate Field Trip. And yes, we're staying squarely on terra firma for this land-based tour. Day one, we'll have a casual opening night meet and greet. Day two is a day of speakers in the classroom with me and my Tampa team at the Hyatt Place Hotel in St. Petersburg, Florida, which is our event hub and preferred place to stay. Then day three, we'll load up on the coach and tour cash flowing properties. It's just north of St. Petersburg, Florida, where you'll find a cash flowing sweet spot. You can meet me and talk to me too. I would like to meet you. I can virtually guarantee that there will be time for that. You'll even notice that we kept the event cost down for you as well. You can get the absolute best price if you register soon before the early bird discount ends. Get all the details at realestatefieldtrip.com. Again, the dates are October 10th to 12th, 2019. That is Thursday night until Saturday afternoon. 
you can register and get all the details for Get Rich Education's Tampa real estate field trip all at realestatefieldtrip.com. I'll be hosting you there, and I look forward to meeting you personally in terrific Tampa, St. Petersburg, Florida. Let's talk to whom I'll call the chief evangelist for seasteading. We had a few audio bumps early in our chat here. They soon dissipate. Let's expand paradigms and talk about floating cities on the world's oceans. Today's guest is president of the Seasteading Institute. They're a nonprofit think tank that promotes the creation of floating cities as a revolutionary solution to some of the world's most pressing problems like rising sea levels, overpopulation, and poor governance. He's also an author and an aquapreneur. Welcome to Get Rich Education, Joe Quirk. Thanks for inviting me, Keith. I've been looking forward to this. Joe, this is such a fascinating topic. We are a real estate investing show, but about 70% of the Earth's surface is covered in water. So talk to us more in general terms about the concept of building and designing your own floating nation. It's a Silicon Valley approach to the problem of poor governance. We have 193 national governments, basically with complete control over seven and a half billion people. And Steve Wozniak didn't bring the personal computer to us by proposing it to Hewlett Packard. He broke away and founded his own company with Steve Jobs, and that became the first Apple computer. So Seasteaders ask, where will the Wozniaks of governance go? Where can the innovators discover better ways of governing ourselves? I became fascinated by seasteading when I met Patry Friedman, who's the grandson of Milton Friedman. And he explained to me how uh, half the world's surface, 45% of it is unclaimed by any nation state. And as you said, more than two thirds of it is basically the ocean. Uh, We live on less than a third of it. And this is a great uh, research and development world where we can create floating cities or floating small homes on the ocean where governance providers could provide different versions of different governments. And as long as people can choose among them voluntarily, we think better solutions will emerge. So I think of them as like iPhones of the sea. You know, Seasteads will be the platforms and you bring your governance app and then people can choose among them. There are so many great ideas out there and we need a place for people to try them. So if you're interested in a startup company, imagine what you could do with your own startup country. So substantial motivation here is proliferation of free enterprise. And I do want to ask you about that some more. But before we leave land, why not just do this on land? New nations are created seemingly every other year anymore. I mean, just in the past few decades, we had the creation of nations like North Macedonia and Montenegro and Eritrea. So why do this at sea rather than on land if you want to kind of promote this system in the society of free enterprise and freedom of ideas? I describe in the Seasteading book how rapidly the creation of new countries has been accelerating. Yeah. This is a measure of the demand for something different. The problem with doing this on on land is that every rock and island and obscure little atoll is claimed by some country. So I described Steve Wozniak. It's like him trying to propose the personal computer to Hewlett Packard, which he was loyal to. He wanted to work at Hewlett Packard, but they rejected this crazy personal computer idea five times in a row. Why would people need a personal computer? Well, he decided to go out and prove it himself. He didn't have another place to go. The initial Apple computer never would have been created. And as a matter of fact, the Apple is what I'm talking to you on right now. So the number of ideas out there for different ways to govern ourselves, whether it's on blockchain or it's on Futarchy, if you follow uh, Silicon Valley blogs, you, people are proposing all sorts of fascinating ideas for how people can instantiate new rules appropriate for the 21st century. But there's no place they can try these out. And we're eager to get the first few started on the first few seasteads and demonstrate that governance is just another product and free enterprise can provide it. And if they go out of business because people don't choose it, then we learn something. And if people choose something better, then we'll set an example, hopefully, that will change uh, the old governments as radically as Hong Kong changed communist China. 
Yeah, it's interesting with capitalism, and you bring up Hong Kong. Really, if you look at the way things have unfolded economically in the past few decades, Hong Kong's capitalism has kind of embarrassed China into giving China more ideas to be more free. I mean, China has set up a special economic zone called Shenzhen, rather than a startup company. It's sort of a startup city, if you will. Yes, and we refer to Hong Kong as a pre-stead. So through historical accident, they sort of ended up this little bastion of free enterprise with a Chinese culture, and Hong Kong created so much wealth so fast that it basically embarrassed China into、yeah. starting its open door policy. And at least a half billion people have exited extreme poverty by opening up all these special economic zones. You mentioned Shenzhen. And there are many others, and probably most of the Chinese peasants have migrated to these special economic zones. And virtually all of them are like up against the coast near the water because the ocean is the superhighway of trade. This started a trend. The most momentous political revolution is happening right now, and it's been happening for the last six decades because of the example set by Hong Kong, and it's the special economic zone movement. More than four and a half thousand special economic zones have proliferated across the world, providing special exemptions from regulations and taxes to create economic prosperity. And it's such a win-win that governments around the world are agreeing to them. And not many people know that the United States has a 276 special little jurisdictions inside little experiments. So this is a bottom-up. Revolution in special jurisdictions that are happening all over the world, and it's creating wealth both for the host country and for the businesses that operate there. So seasteaders are saying, "What if we detach from land completely? Suppose we bring our own land and we absorb all the cost of failure, but we share in the prosperity." So Tom W. Bell is a legal scholar and law professor at Chapman University. He has proposed the sea zone. Which basically takes the best practices that have been discovered in those four and a half thousand special economic zones around the world, and he wants to instantiate them on sustainable floating islands on the ocean. It's basically like a greatest hits package of the best regulations and laws that exist elsewhere, and it will be strongly inclined towards economic freedom. And we'll get to demonstrate how free enterprise works instead of arguing for it on islands where the people that found these islands. Pay the consequences of failure and get the profits if they succeed. I want to ask you more about the business and the enterprise part a bit later. But physically, today there are quite a few people that live in high-priced coastal cities around the world, living on their boat just offshore, since that's more affordable. We would probably say that those people are more integrated with the adjacent land-based economy and society wherever their boat is docked, whether that's in San Diego or Amsterdam or Singapore. And I think you're talking about something substantially different here. So there's both the physical structure and then the economy that will evolve and the society that will evolve on top of it, which is going to be substantially different than other things that are currently in the world. Like you have substantially sized floating oil and gas facilities that are Offshore, you have cruise ships that float three thousand, four thousand people. Although it's only over a period of one week, so can you just talk to us about some of those differences between what a seastead is, including how far offshore does it actually have to be? You offered a great vista for how this is going to scale up. So I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, where because, in my opinion, housing supply is restricted, rents are some of the highest in the world. Yeah. So many people live on boats because it's cheaper to live on a boat than to actually build a house or to rent a tiny apartment. And a friend of mine, a fellow seasteader, is actually starting a company to build floating single-family seasteads in the Bay Area, which he thinks he can beat the per square footage price point and demonstrate seasteads working in waves. You also mentioned、uh, oil rigs. Yes,、uh, oil rigs are very expensive, but they operate in the North Sea, which is some of the most、uh, violent seas in the world. And people play ping pong and pool, so it's possible to create great stability. That's probably, amazing. Probably the best example is a cruise ship. A cruise ship is essentially a floating city, and it's de facto self-governing. So many cruise ships you get on, they fly the flag of Panama. 
or the flag of Liberia. And these countries have virtually no ability to enforce rules on the thousands of ships that fly their flag around the world. So the cruise ship is de facto self-governing. And a captain is essentially a dictator. If you, you know, get in a fight or get drunk or assault one of the women, he can lock you in the brig. He can uh, drop you off at an abandoned island and just wave bye-bye. Happens all the time if you misbehave on a cruise ship. You know, what are you going to do? Sue him in Liberian court? So the question becomes, why don't these tin pot dictators flog their passengers and keel haul their employees? Well, it's because people have choice. Passengers can write a negative review and go choose another cruise line. And that works for employees too. Employees can quit and go choose another cruise line. And you can go online and complain and hurt their business. The cruise company is incentivized to constantly innovate and provide better governance. And it's not because they're necessarily nicer people than politicians. It's that they'll go out of business if they don't provide this governance. There's competition. There are other cruise ship lines. Yes. Market competition among governance providers. Now, imagine if cruise ships never docked. What if they floated permanently? Now, as far as where you have relative freedom, it's very complex. So there's the territorial seas that go out about 12 miles. There are uh, three zones of what we might call freedom going out onto the high seas. The territorial seas go out about 12 miles, and in that area, the country has the same jurisdiction they have on land. Beyond 12 miles, you start to get to, into an interesting place called the contiguous zone, which goes out about 24 miles. And there, you might have some freedoms to start your own hospital, to start your own medical research ship. And then you can get very interesting things with ferrying people out there. To get true independence, and again, it's very complex. You need to go out 200 miles. So within 200 miles is the exclusive economic zone where nations reserve the right to exploit the seabed for natural resources. So if you're floating 25 miles out, as long as you don't exploit the seabed or engage in any piracy, you're probably good to go. But seasteading is a legal frontier you're recognized as sovereign in relationship with other countries. So the idea is to get this started one house, one village, one town at a time and scale up and appeal to the other nations of the world for recognition over time. So when one is out 200 miles on a seastead, I just think about some of the engineering challenges in developing these sorts of miniature worlds. And that might even include hedging oneself against its own set of natural disaster problems like hurricanes or tsunamis. Or can you speak to some of those engineering challenges? Just as the land is very diverse, you know, we have the Sahara Desert, which is one kind of environment. And then we have the Himalayas, which is another kind of environment. The oceans are even more diverse. We have the doldrums, where sailboats used to get stranded for so long that people would start to starve because they couldn't get any wind and they couldn't get any waves. The other extreme, you have the North Seas, which have very high, very rough, very cold waves. And if you want to avoid hurricanes, you want to be near the equator because hurricanes don't cross the equator. They basically spin out from the equator because of the Coriolis force. From Brazil all the way to Africa, basically, there's virtually never been a hurricane recorded. Tsunamis are only dangerous when you're close to land. A tsunami is often caused by an earthquake, and it's like a wave that's more than 100 miles long. So if you're on a boat, you don't even notice a tsunami as it passes beneath you. It's not until it reaches a continent that it starts to tumble and roll and become very dangerous. On the coast, you're a sitting duck in a tsunami. And if a tsunami is coming and you're on a boat near land, what you want to do is get away from land as quickly as possible. So if you're in deeper than 600 feet uh, waters, you're safe from a tsunami. But if you're close to land, you're in a lot of trouble. So we're talking with Joe Quirk, president of the Seasteading Institute. You're listening to Get Rich Education. We'll be right back. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Would you like to know the easiest way to create wealth and passive income with real estate? This is Marco Santorelli with Norada Real Estate Investments. Now you can access the best deals without the stress or hassle of having to find, renovate, or manage those properties. We save you time by providing you with passive income investment properties in some of the best U.S. markets. Learn more by downloading your free copy of The Ultimate Guide to Passive Real Estate Investing. 
There's no obligation and nothing to buy. Simply visit PassiveRealEstateGuide.com and get your free copy today. That's PassiveRealEstateGuide.com. For a real estate investor like you seeking an income property loan, go to Ridge Lending Group NMLS 42056. Over the years, you've heard President Chaley Ridge generously devote her time to you here on the show as a guest. Ridge provides investment property loans in most U.S. states, and you're going to find out how they've helped more people realize their dreams of real estate financial freedom than any other mortgage lender in the entire nation when you get started at RidgeLendingGroup.com. This is Peak Prosperity's Chris Martinson. Listen to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold and Don't Quit Your Daydream. Welcome back to Get Rich Education. We're talking with Joe Quirk. He's the president of the Seasteading Institute. Joe, you started the show by talking about how this is basically a Silicon Valley approach with seasteading, having these floating cities, promoting the idea of free enterprise. A few hundred years ago, migrants left Europe to come to the New World, the United States, and a lot of those people crossed the Atlantic for freedom of expression and religion and freedom of ideas. Today, many would say that the U.S. government has grown so large that it's just full of these inefficiencies and bloated staffs and sometimes over-regulation. So with that in mind, are there any parallels between what has happened to the United States and what a seasteading society could evolve into? The North America was basically a giant seastead where people dissatisfied with the old governments came to try out their wacky, crazy ideas among them uh, democracy, ideas that people could govern themselves, ideas that women could vote. These ideas were crazy at the time, ideas that people shouldn't be allowed to dance. So people founded different states and territories, and the more dissatisfied they got, the further west they moved. And the ideas that worked, like uh, constitutional republics, flourished, and the ideas that didn't work, that dancing should be illegal, didn't flourish. And this was largely because people with new ideas got to try things out and choose among all these different territories. Not many people know that in 1920, it wasn't like saintly politicians decided to let women vote. It actually emerged, as it's described in the Seasteading book, from competition among territories. Wyoming had a six to one gender ratio, and they were trying to find a way to attract women to move out there. Because women had choice among different territories, They were able to demonstrate that women uh, can vote and the world doesn't descend into uh, dystopia. And then, you know, many decades later, the United States decided to make this a national policy. The United States has had a huge effect on the rest of the world because of that experimentation. If it wasn't the United States, we'd probably still have monarchies. The Cold War would have been between monarchies and communism. So the United States set a fabulous example because there was so much choice and federalism that allowed for all this experimentation. The problem is governments and nation states are based on monopoly control of land. And this was the insight that blew my mind about seasteading and got me interested, which is that the reason regulations expand and don't ever go away, and that people who are trying to create seaweed farms and fish farms using 21st century technologies have to contend with regulations written in the 1970s, It's sort of like you can think of it as an evolutionary process where there's lots of variation in rules, but no selection in rules, no rules going away. It just builds and builds and builds and builds, and it doesn't go away because a monopoly of governance is a perfect incentive system to grow, increase power, create more rules, create higher taxes. That's the inevitable trend given human nature. And when Patry Friedman, Milton Friedman's grandson, explained that suppose we founded governance on a fluid frontier instead of land. Suppose we could break up the monopoly of land. Suppose we had floating city blocks, and these were modular, and people could detach and move about and choose the sort of societies they want. You'd have essentially a market dynamic among governance providers and choosers. If You, you call it voting with your house. And that's what made me realize that would be variation in governance providers and selection by residents. And this would be evolution in governance itself, which is the most important problem 
we need to solve if we're going to move into the future. So if we could have more startup governments and they could disassemble and move about and go bankrupt and, and flourish if people chose them and expand, we would have unpredictable innovations. And I think predicting what those innovations would be is akin to Ben Franklin predicting how Manhattan Island is going to work. He couldn't imagine what it could be, but he knew that if we tried something new in a new world, something spectacular could emerge if you attract the best people. So we want to create more floating islands on the ocean to unleash this experimentation. So some might ask, why do this at sea where you move your floating platform? Because today, if there's something you don't agree with, you have the option of moving with your feet to another state or to another country. I mean, a lot of people said that if Donald Trump were elected president, they would move out of the United States, and then they didn't actually do that in almost every case. But how does that differ, moving on land versus moving on sea? Well, it's very similar. We have a, a low-level residual federalism going on. So I live in California. And yes, I am quite amused that when Barack Obama was elected, all my Texas friends said, we're seceding in California. and said, you're crazy. And then Trump was elected, all the California said, we're seceding. And I'm like, why can't everybody have what they want? Why are we forcing other people to do what we want? So I am in California, very frustrated by my high taxes. And every time people go to the polls, my wife and I are taxed more. You know, we both run businesses and own homes. And right next door is Nevada, which has no income tax. As far as I know, no sales tax. But California is so beautiful. But if you notice, being able to choose between Florida, which has no income tax, and California, which has high income tax, allows the state taxes to be relatively low. It's much harder to renounce my citizenship. And all of a sudden, for some strange reason, my federal taxes are very high. So. Peter Thiel pointed this out when he co-founded the Seasteading Institute with my co-author, Patry Friedman, that the more mobile you are and the more choice you have, the lower you're taxed because you're driving the incentives for taxes to go down. So capital is very mobile and it can move around to different jurisdictions and it's taxed relatively lowly. I can move among states. So that's kind of an intermediate ground that incentivizes different states to drive down their taxes. It's very difficult for me to renounce my citizenship. So as a business owner and a homeowner in California, I'm taxed quite high. And uh, the economist Dan Mitchell argues that the lowering of taxes during the 80s was not the result of politicians and their promises, but was the result of tax havens, most of which are island nations, offering better deals at lower taxes, creating tax competition, which drove down taxes in the United States and in the EU. So the more competition you have, the more choice we have, the more governance providers have to hustle to please us, the better it is for us. And uh, seasteaders want to accelerate that market competition among governance providers. Now, one interesting thing that you mentioned is agriculture. And we largely talk about residential real estate on this show, but sometimes we talk about agricultural real estate, where you get an annual income stream from your crop rather than a monthly income stream from a tenant in your dwelling. Agriculture and aquaculture. You know, I think this brings up some interesting possibilities for aquapreneurs, as you call it. On land, we grow a lot of soy and corn and wheat and really a lot of things that aren't all that healthy once you learn more about nutrition. But aquaculture gives one more opportunity to raise healthier, more nutrient-dense crops like seaweed and algae farming and things like that. So can you talk to us about that and what some of these people are actually doing in these seasteads? Yes. Some of the most passionate seasteaders are seaweed and algae cultivators yeah. who are eager to get outside existing jurisdictions and scale up seaweed farming on the sea. So you're right. Corn, wheat, and soy they're not that healthy, they're bad for the environment, and they, our use of agriculture dumps tons of nutrient and carbon pollution into the oceans, creating dead zones that affect marine mammals. I wrote a whole book about that. But aquaculture can restore the environment. Seaweed can absorb this carbon and nutrient pollution. And seaweed is many times more healthy than corn, wheat, and soy, and at least 8,000 edible species have been counted. 
And if it makes you say, Ugh, I don't want to eat seaweed, we already eat seaweed. It's in our products. It's in our toothpaste. It's in our beer. If we had uh, coffee this morning and creamer, it's in our coffee creamer. If you ate a piece of bread, algae products were probably in the fertilizer used to grow the wheat. So algae and seaweed are already integrated into our foods and many of the products we use. Many of them are complete proteins with high fiber and the best kinds of fats. Fish don't synthesize their own omegas, sixes, and threes. They get it by eating algae. So we can go to the base of the food chain, which is algae and seaweed. We can scale up mass seaweed farms on the ocean. And lots of uh, seaweed aquapreneurs want to do this. And we could basically transition from agriculture to aquaculture, open up vast tracts of land on the continents, and use this space on the ocean to farm seaweed. The problem is all the regulations to control seaweed are so onerous that I'm making a documentary right now about a mussel farmer who had to go three miles outside California waters in order to succeed as a mussel farm. And there are several seaweed farmers in my book that are featured with their plans for what they could unleash healthier, better, environmentally restorative food on the oceans. So aquaculture is just one type of industry and commerce that could take place in a seasteading nation. And when we think about industry and commerce and how that intersects with escaping government, oftentimes one thinks of the word regulation, how much government oversight is there on industries. And with regulation, I think a lot of people would agree that some is good. We want the FDA to, for example, maybe give approval to a, a new drug if they can do it in a short period of time. But the problem with a bloated government and a lot of processes is sometimes it takes too long to figure those things out. But we think about regulation as kind of a balance between safety and innovation. So how should seasteed communities regulate or should they? So regulations are a market service just like anything else. And people can't cooperate without rules that they agree on. And I don't have a problem with regulations per se. I have a problem with the monopoly on the provision and enforcement of regulations. Because if you have one monopoly of regulators who can't go out of business and they're in charge of an entire industry, they have no incentive to allow things to happen, but they have a very large incentive to prevent disasters. So the FDA is a good example. New people with new innovations can't easily enter the market because it costs you know, billions of dollars and often more than a decade to bring a new drug to market. So, and the FDA regulators are in an impossible position where they can't be experts on everything that comes across their desk. So they have to approve things in consultation with experts in the industry. So they inevitably create this back and forth friendship relationship that becomes corrupted. What people don't know is that on the ocean, there are many, many free market regulators that operate. Matter of fact, we owe our safety on ships to more than 50 marine classification societies that compete to provide regulations. So if you're building a ship in Singapore, you are competing to have the imprimatur, the stamp of approval of one of these highly respected regulators who can come to you and say, I want an office on your shipyard I want to inspect this and inspect that. And you have to prove to our people that all these things are safe. The shipbuilder is so eager to demonstrate that their ships are safe. They compete to please the regulators and the regulators compete to be the ones that have the most respect. This is also true of fish food. If you look at fish sticks in your local supermarket, you'll find little stamps of approval by little free market regulators. These are not state enforced. And so when you don't have a monopoly on governance and governments have to compete to provide the best rules, they have an incentive to get rid of bad rules and adopt more futuristic rules, more appropriate to where the industry is going. And then we have a market incentive to create this balance that you're talking about between protection from harm and allowing innovations that make things better. And it prevents corruption to have lots of regulators competing to provide the right rules. So we talk about providing the right rules. We can think of that in another light. We can think about security and hedging against crime. If security evolves into an army, an army is kind of a government 
body. And we think about some things about how we would control crime or would we control immigration to the seastead. So can you talk about some of that, about limiting wrongdoers in these communities? Sure. There are probably 100,000 ships on the ocean right now. And there are a diverse number of maritime security firms that provide protection, say on a cruise ship, preventing conflicts from starting on the cruise ship, but even protection from piracy. Insurance companies insure ships for much less if they have private security teams aboard. So all these different maritime security firms can be adapted to seasteads. And meanwhile, I live in Oakland, California, and I have crime in my city. I I have all sorts of bad things going on, but we don't have the most efficient policing because we don't have any choice. Again, there's a monopoly of governance provision in my city, which creates lots of uh, crime. Policing is very expensive in Oakland, and yet crime is not perfect. You know, I compare it to how safe I feel on a cruise ship to how safe I feel in my own city. And it's largely because Oakland provides a monopoly of policing services. So I don't have any choice, and my neighbors don't have any choice among the different firms competing to provide protection services to us. But if we floated and moved about and we had maritime security firms competing for us to pay them voluntarily to provide security, then the services would get better and better and the prices would go down and down. Human beings, we're not a selfish species and we're not a selfless species. We're a family species. So I'm always going to choose my family over strangers. So if you give me political power, I'm going to help my friends and family and allies before I help strangers. Right. So what incentivizes me to help a stranger? Well, if the only way my family can flourish is if I provide a service to strangers. So that's the sort of situation we can create in decentralized world where the land itself is decentralized beneath us. If all the land is connected in continent, that creates an incentive for a military government to control a vast amount of people. And then all the people that have that kind of power serve their allies, families, and friends before they serve strangers. And we want to engage human nature to serve others, accepting that human beings are fundamentally self-interested. You mentioned that there are currently 100,000 ships on the sea in the world. Is there a current seasteading population? There was off the coast of Thailand for about two months. I read Um, about that. My friends uh, Chad and Nadia fell in love and decided to demonstrate that seasteading works and built one outside the territorial seas of Thailand in a very calm sea known as the Andaman Sea. The Thai Navy immediately took issue with that and rode out and confiscated the seastead and uh, issued a charge that includes the death penalty. My friends had to go on the run and they're safe now. I'm very grateful for that. But so far, the Thai police have not issued a charge. This was just the Thai Navy that reacted this way. This is very unfortunate for my friends and provoked a lot of anxiety in people they love. I think this has been ultimately good for the seasteading movement because it sparked an international conversation. And now we're talking with other governments that are interested in being host countries for the first seasteads off their shores. And I'm very excited by that. And that was largely provoked by this incident. So I think other countries around the world won't be as hostile to people seeking independence outside their territorial seas. Hey, it worked because it hit my radar and I remember reading about it. So there you go. It drew attention to this. What kind of currency would a seasteading community use? Any currency they want. Now, people interested in the philosophy of decentralization as a way to promote human flourishing are usually interested in cryptocurrencies and seasteading. Matter of fact, back when most people thought seasteading was crazy, when I would show up at the Bitcoin conference, they'd all be saying, hey, we love you guys. Oh, (laughs) I've always wanted to be involved. So the first seastead was paid for with Bitcoin. So again, it's about the decentralization of power among lots of people. And any technologies that provide this tend to attract people of a certain philosophy. So many people with this philosophy that love seasteading also are interested in cryptocurrencies. But the fact is, you can use whatever kind of currency you want on your seastead. That's the thing. It's a blank slate, relatively. 
where you can provide your own services, your own sort of society. So we always say, stop arguing, start seasteading. You don't have to argue about your political opinions. You could buy a seastead, gather your allies and try to make it work in reality and then demonstrate your ideas by getting people to voluntarily choose to move to your seastead. Well, Joe, this is a huge subject. I'm sure we could go on for hours, but before you tell our audience how they can find out more about you and seasteading, tell me how far away are we from a legitimate seastead nation? A legitimate seastead, I think we could have one in the next year or two. We've got the architecture, we've got the technology, we've got the engineers, and we've got businesses and investors ready to go. We just need to find the location. What it would take to actually have a floating nation on the high seas that's actually recognized by the other nations of the world. I mean, I can imagine Kiribati, spelled Kiribati, is an island nation that's the first one scheduled to sink below sea level probably by the end of the century. I can imagine them transitioning into being a floating society of seasteads. And then you'll have a humanitarian claim and I actually know lawyers who want to make this argument on the floor of the United Nations, saying that just because they went from being a small little island nation to being a floating nation, should they lose their exclusive economic zone? Should they lose their status? Should their children be stateless? And I think we have a humanitarian claim that they should be recognized. Well, now we have a precedent. Suppose someone else builds uh, seasteads right next door. Should they be recognized as sovereign? There are sea mounts, which are basically underwater mountains that come up very close to the surface in very calm seas. There are tens of thousands of these being discovered in the Pacific, especially. And if people want to attach to these and float seasteads, will they be recognized if they have floating airports? I imagine these happening by 2050, and the company we work with, Blue 21, has an ambition to get a billion people on the ocean by 2050. And they're starting now. Check them out. Blue 21, they're a Dutch firm that have designed our seasteads for island nations. And uh, the Dutch definitely understand the problem with rising oceans and dikes. <laughs> yeah, like few others would, for sure. Yes, this just brings up a ton of interesting questions. Well, if you want to learn more about seasteading, I know at seasteading.org that you have a number of photos and that you can actually see how these structures look. But is there any other way that our audience can best learn more about seasteading, Joe? Well, I wrote a book with Patry Friedman, who's Milton Friedman's grandson, called Seasteading, How Floating Nations Will Restore the Environment, Enrich the Poor, Cure the Sick, and Liberate Humanity from Politicians. And I run seasteading.org, which is a nonprofit. It totally relies on donations. And more than a 1,000 people have donated to the Seasteading Institute during its 10-year history. So a lot of people really want to see this happen. And this has helped uh, support our video series. I've done a lot of talks, shown a lot of videos. And our latest one is Tough Questions Answered. So if you go to seasteading.org, check out Tough Questions Answered. So in one or two minutes, we answer questions, you know, what about hurricanes? What about pirates? What if countries invade? How will the law work? We just answer all these questions. Seasteading requires us to flip our assumptions about how society works and think in a new way. Well, it's extremely interesting. I know seasteading has a number of fans. So if you're interested, start at seasteading.org. Joe Quirk, it's been great having you here on the show. Thanks for inviting me, Keith. Great talking with Joe Cork about what's obviously a vast, huge topic with seasteading. Next week on the show, we'll be back to land-based real estate wealth building. I'm going to talk to you about where the market is and how you can position yourself for prosperity. Coming up down the road on the show here, renowned author Jim Rickards makes his Get Rich Education debut as he'll be here to discuss his somewhat ominous brand new economic book called Aftermath. I'm specifically going to ask him how a cash flowing real estate investor will be positioned in the next economic calamity. Also, later, the author of one of the best known real estate investing books of this generation stops by and I'm going to ask him about the numbers. What numbers matter most to you as a real estate investor and why? This week, huge thanks to our guest, president of the Seasteading Institute, Joe Quirk. 
Learn more at seasteading.org. If you get value from Get Rich Education every week, I'd be grateful if you told a friend about the show. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold, and as always, I'll return faithfully next week to help you build your wealth. Don't quit your daydream. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, GetRichEducation.com.